This week's number, 13. In an attempt to evade overweight baggage fees, a teenage traveler wore 13 pounds of clothing. The airline charged her the fee anyway. So no joke here, but a serious offer. If you're out there, this teenager, send us a message. You have an internship with Prop G. That's a serious offer. <laughs> Welcome to Prop G Markets. Today, we're discussing one, Kava's IPO in the fast casual restaurant industry. Two, how private equity makes money in the public markets. And then three, an unpack on Montana's attempt to ban TikTok. Here with the news is someone wearing only 12 and a half pounds <laughs> of clothing and makeup, Prop G Media <laughs> Analyst Ed Elson. Ed, what is going on? I'm good, Scott. I'm busy. I've got uh, college reunions this weekend, and then I'm going to Costa Rica on Wednesday. What, like six-month reunions? Aren't you? How old are you again? <laughs> My second year. Second year reunion. Your second year reunion. Okay, you That's are right. definitely overpaid. <laughs> You've only been out of college for two years. That's right. They have two-year reunions? Yeah, yeah. That's it's ridiculous. A, it's a huge what, deal. So you can say, hey, I've done nothing. What are you up to? <laughs> yeah. Well, I can brag about what I'm doing. There you go. Like, oh, you're there slugging you away at a bank? Oh, I'm, I'm on a podcast. It's pretty cool. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that's why Princeton has an endowment the size of Costa Rica and yet <laughs> continues to reject 92% of their applicants is because they raise money <laughs> from douchebags like you who then applaud those very yep. selective admissions rates. Well, that's right. Anyways, uh, if you do, in fact, give money back to them, do it from your side hustle, whatever that is, mm -hmm. raising hypoallergenic labradoodles. But no, I don't want any Prop G money to go back to Princeton. Are we clear? <laughs> Are we clear reunion committee and Ed Elson? That's right. At least for the next five years. There you go. Then I'll then I'll start to <laughs> then I'll start to want to give back. Probably they're there very convincing with their their donation strategies. Well, they uh, really need it. I mean, what's <laughs> Princeton's endowment? I think it's something like something seven absurd. million dollars per student. Yeah, they really need your money, Ed. Yeah. I, that's that is absolutely the best use of funds for me right now is to help. Princeton advance um, the, the, <laughs> the trajectory of the children of wealthy people and freakishly mm -hmm. remarkable kids from other households that help smear Vaseline over the lens of their mendacious fuckery and income inequality. Anyways, <laughs> on to the news. <laughs> There's actually one final stat you might like. This, uh, this Princeton reunions thing is consistently the largest single beer order in the United States annually. Bigger than the Super Bowl? Wait, mm -hmm. really? Mm -hmm. Princeton people drink beer? I would have thought That's it'd be right. like, the, you know, the mo more Pimm's Cups are ordered, special <laughs> order from, really? Yeah. Wow, beer. Three straight days just drinking beer. So I'll be on good form next week. I got it. I got to be honest. I like Princeton or I hate them less now. <laughs> I hate them less now. Get to the news, Ed. Let's do it. Let's start with our weekly review of Market Vitals. The S&P was down. Bitcoin continued its month of declines, and the yield on 10-year treasuries climbed. Shifting to the headlines. Fitch, a top three credit rating agency, placed the US AAA rating on watch for a potential downgrade as debt ceiling negotiations drag on in Washington. The government could default as soon as this week if Congress doesn't raise the debt ceiling. UK inflation dropped to 8.7% year over year in April. That's down from 10.1% in March, but it was still higher than the Bank of England's forecast of 8.4%. Adidas cut ties with Kanye West last October, but it's sitting on $1.3 billion worth of Yeezys. So it's announced it will start selling them again. A quote, significant amount of the proceeds will go to organizations combating racism and anti-Semitism, though Adidas did not specify what that amount will actually be. For Scott's take on the Kanye debacle, check out our episode from October 31st. HBO Max has changed its name to Max. The content is the same, but HBO is now a sub-brand alongside the broader Time Warner Discovery catalog. And finally, NVIDIA stocks soared almost 30%, after the company's earnings and forecasts shattered expectations, NVIDIA has added more than $500 billion in market value so far this year. That's amid the AI frenzy, and it is well positioned to become the first trillion dollar chip maker. Scott, what are your thoughts? Well, first off, let's just talk about 
the kind of the I don't know the most important company that doesn't get that much news, and that's Nvidia. And yep. I don't know if there's strategy here, but essentially, just as we've always found ways to put fossil fuels to use, there's always is it fair to say demand is outstrips supply? It, it feels as if for the last hundred or hundred and fifty years, we've always found more innovative ways to use energy, mm -hmm. and that would was also true of processing power. That no matter how much processing power AWS gave us or how fast chips got, we've always been able to find more ways to use more processing power. And whether it's the metaverse or now um, AI, the the energy that that is demanded here is essentially a processing power or chip speed or I don't know what the correct term is, but NVIDIA is just an example of, if you were to say, well, what's an example that things aren't as, as bad in America as people would say, is that if you hear about a company that's powering the metaverse and AI all over the world, yep. chances are it's, it's within a seven mile radius of SFO. I mean, for all the shit posting around San Francisco and the quality of life, and I think those concerns are real, there's something about the Bay Area that continues to attract incredible uh, culture, management, IP, and there's just no getting around it. This company is a juggernaut. Mm -hmm. And chips are now center of a national defense debate. But it's, you know, I would say with the exception of vaccines, what is uh, a more important product than chips? And NVIDIA appears to be the best of a very important uh, sector. HBO Max, this will go down in history as a first ballot Hall of Fame, head up your ass brand strategy move. There's something in Brand strategy. We spend two sessions in my brand strategy course uh, at NYU called brand architecture. Mm -hmm. And in an era of M and A and consolidation, when all of a sudden Norwest owns Wells Fargo, and Wells Fargo is the better brand than a Minneapolis than a Minneapolis commercial bank that specializes in mortgages, what do you do? You say Wells Fargo and Norwest company, and then ultimately you drop Norwest and becomes Wells Fargo. When Dayton Hudson starts this cool retailer called Target, you know, Dayton Hudson Target, Target a Dayton Hudson company, and then just Target, and then the whole thing becomes Target as Dayton Hudson fades to black. You know, these Morgan Stanley, Dean Witter, right? Dean Witter was on top. They were the bigger company. But what do you know? Morgan Stanley is a better brand, and now it's just Morgan Stanley. Whenever you have really brain-dead brand moves that just make absolutely no sense, right? There's Dotson, which was a nice brand in the 70s. When I was at, I think it was Emilita elementary school, our principal was just the coolest cat. He had great blow-dried hair. He used to wear those cool tweed jackets with elbow pads. But he used to roll up, true story, he would roll up to the faculty parking lot about second period, clearly hung over. And after, you know, having a lovely over for a little Lancer's, little Lancer's wine and listen to the fifth dimension, uh, he would show up about 11 in the morning and he'd had this silver Datsun 240Z, which was sort of the closest that the Japanese got to a Porsche. It was such an incredible uh, sports coupe. It was just a really unique design, great performance. And it would be like a Who concert. We'd be playing a tetherball or handball, but essentially it would be like a Who concert when Principal Yukelson would roll up in his 240Z and we would rush the fence and trample each other like, uh, you know, like a, a, a football game or a Who concert out of control to see the 240Z. Mm -hmm. And then what does Datsun do? The Stiffs of Corporate have this ego thing where they want a global brand, and it was called Nissan and other markets. So they trash the brand. And in the weirdest brand architecture transition move, it had the Datsun logo on the front and then the Nissan logo on the back. So it was like, mm -hmm. oh, it's a Datsun. There it goes. No, it's a Nissan. Mm -hmm. And this is, but this takes the cake. HBO, a brand is a series of intangible associations that result in a rational trial or margin. And those associations, our emotions, are built slowly over time. You can't really buy or build a brand. It's like nine women can't have a baby in a month. Uh, the same is true of a brand. You can't build a brand like it. You could have infinite capital and you couldn't build a brand like HBO in two, three, five, maybe even 10 years. And HBO means a level of quality program that is so tapped into the cultural zeitgeist and has such incredible execution uh, as a function of HBO's culture, which was able to basically be a flyweight that could kick the shit out of 
Larry Holmes. You know, they were spending two or three billion a year on content. Uh, Netflix was spending 17 billion. And yet, what are we all talking about? We're all talking about succession. What, what did we used to talk about? Game of Thrones. They consistently figure out a way to put out the most culturally relevant content. And for me, I mean, I have real bias here. Some of my most, I think, moving moments in media, and media is really moving. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when the mom breaking down in tears in Six Feet Under. But it's the trying that makes you feel loved. How are you going to feel loved if you don't ever let me try? Or the boys going on the bus that um, ran into their father and ultimately killed him. This is the bus. What bus? The bus. The mafia soldier peering through or looking through photo albums of vacations at the Jersey Shore before he hangs himself. That's a soprano. So I remember um, the Prince of Dorne, um, Pedro Pascal, saying to Tyrion Lannister that, you know, I will be your champion. I will be your champion. <laughs> I mean, these moments are so powerful. And those moments, uh, when they happened in media, usually happened on HBO. And it built this brand that meant just a, a excellence through the ability to capture mo uh, motion in scripted drama. And they're taking that brand and immolating it so they can call it Max. I mean, this is just, this is an outrage, Ash. <laughs> this is an outrage. And by the way, we're changing the name of the Prop G show to HBO, and we're just going to see what happens. But well, let, this let me is, just, let, I'm sorry, let me go just, ahead. Let me just push rant. back on this. Yeah. Uh, so try, I bitch, actually, try. I actually like... I actually like this rebrand. I said I liked it on Twitter. I said I just think it sounds cleaner. Um, and I got a lot of pushback, a lot of unfollows, interestingly. Um, but the way I see it is, you know, you you just made the analogy of the Dotson logo on the front, Nissan logo on the back. Isn't that sort of what's going on here with HBO Max combining the two? I mean, maybe in the best of the best situation maybe for you would be you just call the streamer HBO. But there are all of these other production companies. They have to now transition getting the Discovery Plus content onto the Max, uh, onto the Max platform. Don't you think that Max is just kind of cleaner? Plus, the HBO, the HBO production studio is still going to exist. You're still going to see HBO original, uh, The Last of Us, HBO original Game of Thrones. You're still going to have that brand existing. But this, to me, just feels cleaner. Plus. They've got that that bullseye through the A in the max, which is sort of a, a hat tip to the HBO brand. Uh, <laughs> well, here's what I, how I'll end. I kind of like it. <laughs> what do you think of that? Well, uh, <laughs> well, first off, let's let's nod to your logic and let's change the name of your educational institution to Prince because it's cleaner, Ed. <laughs> it's cleaner. So you're at the university formerly known as Prince. <laughs> like. It, <laughs> The notion that we're gonna we're gonna change something to Max and take decades of branding in intangible associations, what you had with HBO is anything on HBO I would trial. That I had so much confidence and trust in that brand, and brand right. is sort of synonymous with differentiation and trust. That any show that came out on HBO I would trial. And the thing about HBO that made it so successful wasn't the shows that were on it; it was the shows that weren't on it. Mm -hmm. And that is the bar is just a little bit higher, whereas Netflix is like, you know, we're going to green light pretty much everything. Amazon is is essentially we're the Walmart. We just any hey, you want to sell through us anything. It actually has more content than any streaming network. HBO was the luxury brand. It was the Hermes bags. The L, it was the it was the LVMH, the Hermes bag, the Birkin bag, the Chanel of media. And it was also had incredible self-expressive benefit. I remember parties in the 70s in Southern California where my dad was trying to fuck everyone that wasn't his wife. He would literally go up to them and then one of his first, one part of his rap was, oh, in our household, we only watch HBO. Like that was <laughs> no. some big flex. Wow. Or maybe it was the early <laughs> 80s. I don't know. Anyways, I'm trying to think. Was it between his third and his fourth divorce? Anyways, but <laughs> he saw that as a sign of, of prestige. 
of, mm-hmm. of self-expressive benefit. It, I mean, this thing called on so many brand attributes, even internally. Yeah. I think that they were going to have a much easier time attracting talent, the best writers, the best actors to an HBO production as opposed to a Max production. And I think that similar to every bad decision made in brand strategy, it all circles back or can be reverse engineered back to a 50 or 60 year old something individual who realizes who realizes they're going to die and their ego starts to take over all mm-hmm. their decisions. And I'm sure because he didn't come from HBO and he didn't invent it, he was at Discovery. Yep. He's pissed off the whole thing isn't called Discovery. He wants to have his name on something original, the guy who built Max. And he's destroyed shareholder value. If you're LVMH and you have Dior, you don't call it Louis, v- Louis Vuitton and have a Dior logo in the middle of it. I mm-hmm. mean, this is these things are are almost impossible to build. This kind mm-hmm. of brand, a brand of this equity is literally capturing lightning in a bottle over and over for decades and yep. to just trash it and say oh we're now we're max i mean this will go down as one of the dumbest moves in the history of brand strategy they could consolidate yep. the back end they could bring all the headquarters together they could have one cfo but to not make this the brand that's on top or have it re- remain a, a sub brand is literally to say okay uh, we're going to take uh, Celine, which is owned by, I think Celine is owned by, is it owned by LVMH? And call it the LVMH bag. It just, yep. you just don't do that. The, the equity here, this reflects poor decision making. Uh, you know, we meant to, we meant you should hold on to HBO, not Max, said every consultant and marketing executive to and with Time Warner with an IQ over 80. <laughs> this is, this is literally, uh, first ballot Hall of Fame of stupid fucking decisions. Anyways, mm-hmm. before you say anything really dumb, I'm going to keep going here. <laughs> Adidas, yeah, I feel for them. Uh, they made or as I like to call them, Adidas. Because, you know, I live in Europe now, Ed. I live in mm-hmm. Europe. That's right. Uh, because America is still the best place to make money. I said this at the Wall Street Journal CEO conference yesterday where they were horrified because I kept dropping F-bombs on stage. <laughs> but, oh, and by the way, you know who spoke three hours before me? I'll give you a hint. He's a mendacious fuck that has an automobile company and says that uh, George Soros hates humanity. Anyways, me oh, and Elon Musk on the Elon. same stage. Uh, That's awesome. I, and and they told me that my my session had a bigger turnout. Hello, but the really? technology didn't work. Get that little <laughs> little inside dig at the DeSantis announcement. Uh, I like Adidas. I think they I think they showed real metal by saying, you know, sorry, Kanye, that shit just don't that kind of anti-Semitic weirdness. Just that dog don't hunt here, regardless of the regardless of, of the economic harm. And I think their stock, that was a buying opportunity when it went down, and I think it's ripped back. $1.3 billion. My question would be, and it's easy to be a purist and heckle from the cheap seats, you know, my question would be, is any of that money going to go to him? And if it does, you know, that, uh, that it's sort of uncomfortable. But selling a bunch of Yeezys, they will actually probably clear out pretty fast because they'll probably become collector's items. My son's first artisanal collection item is their kicks, right? They they actually see value in limited, like they don't collect baseball cards. They don't, for sh- for a hot moment, they're like, should we buy Dogecoin? Because they thought they would get rich quick. But the the StockX, and it's amazing yeah. what the shoe manufacturers have done. I think especially Nike creating scarcity value and, and kind of collector's value, if you will. I bet these become collector's items. Yeah. Uh, so I but think just- it's going to- Go ahead. Sorry, I just want to push back. I mean, we talked about this issue on no mercy, no malice. And one of the things that we pointed out is that at certain points, corporations need to draw a line um, just to sort of remind ourselves that a line even exists in the first place. And we commended uh, Adidas for taking action about this. Doesn't this kind of nullify everything that they did? I mean, it's it's the epitome of all talk, no action. Shouldn't we be making, I don't know, maybe a bigger deal out of this? 1.3 billion, right? Yep. It's just a lot of money. Like, it's easy to be a purist. They're not producing anymore. They severed the relationship. I mean, I I just, I empathize with the board members here. Like $1.3 billion, if that shit, if we just burn it and we, when we say to the world, aren't we pure? Yeah. Okay. That puts us in a hole that makes it harder for us to compete with Nike, makes us makes it harder for us to be economically viable. 
and continue to be a good company that makes the right decision in the long term. So I sort of give them a hall pass here. It's a lot mm -hmm. of money. Mm -hmm. You know, they're trying to say we're going to, you know, donate some of this money to causes that are directly trying to combat the venom and weirdness that came out of, you know, uh, Kanye's mouth. Yeah. But $1.3 billion is, that's a serious hit to the company and the employees and the stakeholders. And like I said, it's just so easy to be a purist outside the company walls. Yeah. So I, I, I give them a little bit of a hall pass here. And, but, you know, I think that they should do what uh, you suggest and they should just change the brand name to DOS. <laughs> like DOS boot. That's cleaner, isn't it? DOS. It's clean. Jesus, I can't believe you, you think this HPL. I can't, I seriously can't get over it. That makes me question every decision <laughs> we've made about you, Ed. Uh, UK inflation coming down to 8.7%. I'm really happy about that. I like the new PM. He strikes me as really reasonable. Uh, when you have the United Kingdom, they get the big stuff right. They get the big stuff right. They're not talking they're not. about whether or not to ban assault weapons because they they banned them 26 years ago. They're mm -hmm. not talking about bathrooms because they're just like, well, of course, trans people should have rights. Why are, we yeah. don't we don't need to have a conversation around it. And they don't. There, there's absolutely no discussion about whether or not we should force women to carry their baby to term. That's just well, don't be ridiculous. Yeah. They get the big stuff right, but they have managed to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory with uh, Brexit. I mean, that was just, mm -hmm. uh, it's just hard to imagine, oh, things are going well for us. We have a great culture. We're seen as a jumping off point for Europe. We have amazing educational institutions and amazing culture. The wealthiest people in the world want to all either have a home here or in New York. We're just set up for success. How could we really fuck ourselves in one fell swoop? And they managed to do it with Brexit. It's the only country I believe in Europe that hasn't grown in the last five years. Mm -hmm. So the worst of both worlds, low growth and high inflation, means that every year the quality of life of Brits goes down. I mean, it's pretty striking. I'm, I um, take the train, the Paddington Express, which is lovely, which is lovely, back from Heathrow. And you don't have to get very far. I mean, London has so much wealth. It is staggering how much wealth it is. There is here, not because Brits are that productive or Londoners are so productive, but basically Tony Blair put in place a series of private property laws where if you made billions as a war criminal or as an <laughs> oligarch yeah. or because your great uncle is some minister at Saudi Aramco, mm -hmm. bring your money here and we'll protect it and you'll have a really nice life. So they're kind yeah. of in the we're kind of or London is really sort of the ultimate butler. And I think we had a, a really interesting journalist from The Guardian. I forget his yeah. name talking about oh, yeah, uh, uh, how it's become the world's butler. But they're set up for success. But you get just 10 miles out, outside of London, you realize that there's real struggles here. And there's real, there's people who are, you know, don't have a lot of prosperity. And those people get hit hard. When their food prices are up 17%, but wages are up 4%, that means they can't take a summer vacation. So I'm glad to see inflation coming down. The debt crisis, I'm calling it. I think we do what we always do. I think we go right up to the edge here. I think Speaker McCarthy is, uh, I, I hate to use the R word, but I do think he's reasonable. I think in a back room, they've winked and nodded at each other and said, okay, I got to, he said, Mr. President, I got to pretend I'm fucking crazy to keep the crazies in line mm -hmm. and pretend that I'm hearing them and acting crazy and we'll get right up to the eve of this thing. But this would just be, this is just mutually assured destruction. Everyone would come out of this looking terrible. All of a sudden, um, you know, the military would stop getting paid. Our vendors would stop getting paid. Social Security recipients would stop. That's the people we got to be worried about is the seniors. They'll, you want to see an insurrection? I mean, when they start storming the, the movie set where Murder, She Wrote is filmed and they find out it's no longer in production, watch out. They're coming they're coming for you. I thought that was funny. I was expecting a laugh <laughs> from you, Ed. You don't even know what Murder, She Wrote is, do you? I bet they're not going to watch that at the 24-month reunion at Prince. <laughs> Anyways. Well, just one last thing on, on the credit rating. Don't you think that the mistake has already been made by even letting it get this close? I mean, last time this happened was in 2008. Um, we, we did not reach a debt crisis, but we did cut it really close. And we got a downgrade in our credit ratings from a lot of these ratings agencies. The fact that they're even talking about it feels like maybe they could, we could get a downgrade anyway. Don't you feel like we've already fucked up in a way? 
Yeah, but if you look at interest rates, I think interest rates have actually come down. I think they've ticked down the last few weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and the only reason I say that is because I'm I have to refinance all these mortgages. I got right. a mortgage. Let's let's turn this back to me. <laughs> I had a mortgage on my my um, Soho place. It was two point three seven five. That's what I was able to borrow money at. Mm-hmm. And I'm literally hating myself that I only got a five year, not a thirty year, because yep. I grew up. It's been so long. The trajectory of interest rates has just been straight down since the eighties. Yeah. So you just you just were kind of had this illusion of security or delusion of security. I should have listened to Bill Cohen or Barry Ritholtz that interest rates had to go up. But now they're talking, I'm talking about refining at five point five and a half. And that's only mm-hmm. because all these bankers want to do business with me. So I, I but yeah, my exactly. three hundred and twenty bips on call it you know, whatever, big ass mortgage. I mean, that's real money. But anyways, my point is they've said that actually interest rates have actually come down. I don't think the markets fully believe yeah, exactly. we're that stupid. I don't think that, yeah. the, you know, where do we see panic in the markets right now? I don't see it. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to our next story. Fast casual Mediterranean restaurant chain Carver has filed to raise $100 million in an IPO. Carver's S1 registration statement shows strong growth. Revenue is up 28% year over year, and there are now 263 restaurant locations across 22 states. That's up from 164 in 2021. However, the company is not yet profitable and lost $60 million last year. Other publicly listed fast casual chains include Sweetgreen and Chipotle. Sweetgreen had an initially successful IPO in 2021, but it got hammered in the downturn. The stock's fallen 80% since it went public. Meanwhile, Chipotle has been one of the best performing stocks this year, up 48%. So, Scott, you were on the board of Panera Bread, which is sort of a pioneer of the fast casual category. What do you make of Carver's IPO? Well, I'm pulling for it because I know the people at Panera and they're super smart and super hardworking. And if this goes well, it probably sets up for a warm reception of the public markets for Panera. So I'm, I'm pulling for it. I'm sorry, I, this was referring to the Carva IPO. Yeah, I know. I know. Okay. Uh, and I'm making, uh, I'm doing okay. a metaphor. You graduate, okay. you graduate a prince. Let me, let me walk you through this. <laughs> Essentially, I'm saying that if the Carva uh, IPO goes well, it'll, it'll connote good things for Got other sorry. fast casual um, <laughs> trying to 24 month reunion. How fucking ridiculous is that? Seriously, how ridiculous is that? Should have never said it. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, like the revenue grew 13% in 2022, uh, and they're up 28% year on year so far this year. They want to open about 40 new restaurants. Uh, that will be, I think, about a 15% growth. And loss will increase as the company opens. It's probably a really good time to open restaurants right now because that. Typically, opening restaurants, the the key cost driver or the risk is the cost you get the real estate for. And I can't imagine, I mean, for the first time in probably 30 years or in a while, I shouldn't say 30 years, maybe since 2009, the the tenant has leverage over the landlord. The best Mm -hmm. real estate in America was kind of owned by two or three big operators. They'd kind of developed an oligopoly or oligopoly pricing power. And it was just very expensive to go into, you know, your kind of tier A malls. And now I would bet that there's a lot of uh, mall operators or real estate owners who are being very creative and flexible around terms. So that that's that's good for Kava. I, I know that commodity prices are up, which has hurt margins. We were feeling yeah. that at Panera, but I imagine they're starting to come down. Um, so we'll see. I wonder if Sweet Green's problem. I mean, unless it's Chipotle, I kind of don't care as a consumer. Mm-hmm. Um, but and I'm pretty sure I'm about 10% of that, I don't know, whatever it was, 40% or 28% increase in the increase in the stock price. Mm-hmm. Actually, Chipotle is up 48% this year. Oh, my God. Now, if you could have a NVIDIA burrito bowl, that, that would be genius. <laughs> um, anyways, but I think Sweetgreen's been hammered by people not returning to the office. I bet that's a big kind of lunchtime thing in, Mm -hmm. you know, in in urban centers where there's big offices. And I think you're going to, you know, I I don't know. The the honest answer is I'm blathering on here because I don't know. You're young Mm -hmm. and eat at shitty places. What is Kava? Well, Kava is just a fast, casual, i.e. healthy 
slightly more high quality, slightly higher quality, slightly more expensive um, fast food restaurant. And the style is Mediterranean. And I guess the main insight here is that we've seen this massive explosion in this category in the last few decades. So in t- in 2009, there were 17,000 fast casual restaurants in the US. It was a $19 billion market. <clears throat> By 2018, that number had doubled to 35,000 restaurants. Uh, It had grown into a $48 billion market. The global market is expected to reach $209 billion in annual sales by 2027. Um, So it it definitely feels like this is a a big global consumer shift from traditional fast food to fast casual. Um, So I guess my question to you, especially given your experience at Panera Bread, would be, what is changing about consumer preferences in the food industry? And do you think that we're going to see a decline in the the staple fast food brands? Uh, the only insight I would have is that think of them not as much as restaurants, but as distribution centers. Mm-hmm. And that is um, now over 50%, I believe, of purchases at Panera originate digitally. People, mm. you know, buy, buy online, pick up in store, drive through, bomb in, bomb out, delivery. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's uh, COVID sort of accelerated that trend and they had to build in new capabilities. And COVID, to a certain extent, gave them cloud cover to make these types of investments. Yep. So, I mean, the innovation is pretty striking. I still think, I mean, the other thing that just always amazed everybody was if you, Chipotle, Panera, and Starbucks had similar NPS scores, somewhere I think in the low 60s. People love mm-hmm. love those brands. Could you explain what NPS means? Net promoter score is basically you're likely to tell someone else, would you recommend this to a friend, would you not? And then it's a ratio yeah. of those that creates an NPS. And that number or that is seen as a very simple metric that kind of connotes the value of the product. You know, would you recommend it to a friend at the end of the day? Mm-hmm. And, you know, we all studied the test around NPS. And which, anyways, a whole different talk show there. But the NPS for Chick-fil-A is like low 80s. I mean, mm-hmm. Chick-fil-A is a phenomena. Mm-hmm. And uh, I would argue the reason they've done that is because their compensation strategy, they lend money to people who want to be store managers. So there's an owner there at all times. And if you really think about great restaurants and great retail, it's kind of a function of the level of vested interest or ownership that someone has running the store because you can just feel it. When you're in a restaurant where the owner's there, just everything works better. Yep. Um, but the uh, sort of thinking of them as distribution centers as opposed to restaurants, um, figuring out a way, I'm, I'm calling on my best examples, in an outburger, it strikes me that the uh, employees are happier and you can sort of feel the vibe. But sometimes when I go into kind of a fast food restaurant or retail in general, you get the sense you're you're talking to someone who's thinking about the most recent casting they didn't get, and they just, they hate their life. They hate being there. Mm-hmm. And they're there, not out of choice, they're there because they have to be. And I guess that's sort of a decent definition of work, unfortunately, but <laughs> I feel differently. When you go into an in and out Burger, they seem to be, you know, kind of like there seems to be a spirit of camaraderie. Their uniforms are clean. They seem just generally, I don't know, not hating their day as much as other fast food places. Mm -hmm. I always feel like the food is, I don't want to say last, but the the culture, the cost of the real estate, and then figuring out a way to create more dollars per square foot through digital technology. And then the one thing I don't think they've done that Panera's actually been able to do is that they've been able to do is these um, um, loyalty programs. And at one Mm. point, Starbucks with their points program was like the eighth largest bank in America because it had something like $30 billion and Starbucks point or preloaded yep. Starbucks cards. But um, I, look, retail has traditionally been a great way to scale a business. I think it's over-invested. I think it's a very difficult business, but fast casual. I hope that I hope that it um, this goes well. And it's also, well, just talking about Chipotle, uh, 7,000 restaurants um, uh, is what they envision for North America. It currently has 3,000, so there's going to be a lot more Chipotle, which is just going to be wonderful for the world. Um, and we talked about it up 48%. It's valued at an enterprise value to EBITDA of 36 times. That's greater than Apple, Amazon, or Alphabet. So mm-hmm. if you want a tech stock, invest in Chipotle, or at least a company that's got tech 
big tech like valuations, that probably means you should avoid it, quite frankly. Um, and then Sweet Green has had, got a little bit more hair on it. The profit margins um, at Sweet Green are kind of half of what Chipotle is, mm -hmm. and at Cava, they're somewhere they're somewhere in between. So it's going to be really, really interesting. The thing that makes me want to try Cava is that the research that uh, Mia pulled together, Cava spends thirty two percent of their costs on food, uh, where Sweet Green spends twenty eight percent and thirty percent. And how much does lettuce cost? Anyways, and yeah. then labor, it's interesting, sweet green, 31%. And then occupancy. What's interesting is Chipotle only spends 5% of their total revenue on occupancy. And we used to, in specialty retail, have this basic metric. And that was if you could get below 12% of your revenue going to the occupancy costs, you had a model that worked. Sweet what is green, the, What actually are the occupancy costs? What is, what is rent, that? Rent. Rent and yeah. utilities. Four-wall okay. unit economics. Yep. Cost me fifty thousand bucks. I have to spend. I have to send the landlord fifty thousand bucks, and then another ten thousand in insurance and, and lights and utilities, and at sixty thousand, and then you know I do, I do. Um, I don't know seven hundred and twenty thousand in revenue. That means yep. I have what is that eight percent overhead costs. Anyways, yep. or eight and a half percent. I did that in my head. That's because I did a lot of drugs as I did not go to Prince. There, <laughs> we're just going to keep coming back to that edge. Keep so do, keep doing it. But that five percent, that five percent number, uh, occupancy as a percentage of total revenue isn't isn't because they have better deals. It's because they run so much revenue through those stores. Yeah. I mean, Chipotle. It's a phenomenon. I used to go down to CNBC on Wall Street every Wednesday before they unceremoniously canceled me, um, which I never bring up. And I used <laughs> to go to Chipotle, and there was always a line. But the thing about the line is it moves really fast, mm -hmm. and the queuing. I mean, they just. Uh, I used to go to a southern Mexican place called Dos Toros, started by two cow guys. It was just this fantastic Mexican place. But they didn't have the capital to make kind of big places where the flow could go faster. So I imagine that they don't new, do a fraction of the volume. But Chipotle is just a business juggernaut. They just do, mm -hmm. a, they do a fantastic job. And Cava, my guess is they won't get the same multiple. But it's it, it, both Cava and I forget the other one it's, uh, that are filed. The most important thing about them is not what they say about Kava, not what they says about fast casual, but what it'll say about the state of the IPO market. That's what everyone mm -hmm. will take from this. Yep, 100%. Okay, let's move on to our second story. Private equity firms can make a big return when their portfolio companies go public. But typically, that payday doesn't materialize right away. In fact, only 3% of private equity firms fully exit at the IPO. Instead, they sell their stakes slowly in incremental sales known as follow-ons. The average PE firm finishes selling its stake three years after the IPO. That includes the initial six-month lockup period, which is standard in IPOs. And many private equity firms hold for even longer, some for more than a decade, as they hope to sell above the IPO price. But this year has proven to be an unusual one for follow-ons. New data shows that private equity-backed follow-on sales are up 180% year over year, but almost two-thirds of those deals were priced below the company's IPO price. One example is Blackstone. Two months ago, the private equity giant sold its remaining stake in dating app Bumble for half of what it was worth when Bumble went public in 2021. In other words, private equity firms are scrambling to sell their stakes, but they're doing so at massive discounts. So, my question to you, Scott, why are they doing this? Because they can do math. And that is, if you look at, I remember meeting a guy named Don Valentine, who was, I think, the founder of Sequoia Capital. Mm -hmm. And I met him at a talk at, that he gave at uh, Haas. And this must have been 20, 25 years ago. And he said the biggest mistake they made was not holding on to the equity of their companies that went public. And they invest in companies like Amazon and Google and a lot of private equity players and VCs said, you know, looked at these unbelievable growth companies that turned into just giants. Yep. If we'd held on to this company two, three, 10 years post IPO, we would have made a zillion percent. But then the entire retail market got horny for those types of returns and started piling into total shit, you know, yep. like Virgin Galactic and I mean, just stupid shit, right? Things that made absolutely no sense. And these guys, and the whole market got taken up, and these guys look at basic things like price earnings, and they realize that regardless of the heat, regardless of what's in trend or off trend, ultimately, 
fundamentals raise their head. And when you look at a company like Bumble, I'm sure they did the math and said, okay, let's value it against Match. Let's value it against other companies growing at the same amount. And even at, even at half of where it was trading at its IPO price, ignore the IPO price. And this is what you're supposed to do as an investor. You're supposed to ignore history. You're not supposed to anchor yeah. off of past prices. I have trouble buying any stock. I look at NVIDIA, I think great stock, but it's up 140% this year. I shouldn't buy because I hate to buy things. I hate to miss out. And but the reality is you should just look at it here today. And what's what's happened to it makes no sense. And so the PE guys look at a stock like Bumble and they go, okay, even though it's been cut in half, it's still overvalued. Mm -hmm. And so we should get the hell out of Dodge. Typically what they did is to be good actors is they sold slowly. They didn't want to impact the market. They didn't want to take the stock down. Mm -hmm. They wanted to be good investors. Maybe there's some upside here that we can participate in. If we sell a little along the way, we get some of the updraft but we start taking some money off the table. And also PE firms aren't supposed to be public markets investors. That's not right. why, you know, that's not why CalPERS invest in them. If CalPERS wants public market investors, they'll invest in a hedge fund that invests in, you know, stocks. Could you explain to us what CalPERS is? Well, it's the pension fund for, I think, California teachers. Is that right? California, yeah. or it's the pension fund for California employees. I forget which one it is. Teachers. Sorry. Oh, is it teachers? Excuse me. Yeah. But it's it's enormous. And it's also considered great capital because it's very sticky capital. Once they invest in you, they usually you know, keep their capital there. They don't redeem. And that's what you want as an yeah. investor. You, want, you don't want hot money. You want money that sticks with you. Anyways, they're a great investor. They, you know, they don't we need to invest in a private equity or a VC firm that all of a sudden thinks that they are in the business of managing a stock portfolio. That's not mm -hmm. why they invest in them. So they have an onus, and it's in their kind of mission, if you will, to sl to sell out. But they do it usually slowly. But in this instance, when they look at a market where retail investors have pushed, you know, kind of mediocre companies into stratospheric valuations, they do a partners meeting and they go, "Okay, this is a great company. Um, it, we've done really well here." And traditionally, companies like this trade at a PE of 20, and this mm -hmm. one's trading at 80. It used to mm -hmm. be trading at 160, but it's still trading at four times where it should be. Let's get the hell out of Dodge. Mm -hmm. And they also probably are in the midst of raising another fund. A lot of it comes down to something called a mark. And that mm -hmm. is, whenever you see bad behavior on the part of an investor in a board meeting, it's usually got something to do with their mark. And that is, Say their fund isn't going very well, but this is the one stock that is going well. And rather than raise two hundred million at a lower valuation for a private company, which would make more sense, they'd rather raise fifty million at a flat valuation, even if it's uh, just uh, related parties around the table, because they don't want to take they don't want to mark the value of their stake in that company down, because right. then they would have to report that to their limiteds which takes their returns down, which makes yep. it a little harder to raise money for their next funds. So there's a right. lot of jazz hands and a lot of things that go into timing around sales of private yeah. investors. So one thing I didn't realize is, but it, it's totally obvious now that I know, uh, when you hold on to those public holdings, you still get to charge a management fee. So the management fee is around 1% to 2% for private equity and VC firms. Um, which basically creates an incentive to continue to hold on to your public holdings. And just some data, I didn't really realize this. As you said, private equity firms are not supposed to be investing in the public markets. But uh, the, average, the, the average period at which a private equity firm sells its stake is three years after the IPO. Um, in roughly a quarter of deals, private equity firms retain around half of their holdings after five years. Um, it feels like there's this strange incentive for the general partners to keep charging fees by holding on to the to their uh, stake for as long as possible. Um, do you think that that's accurate? Am I being too cynical there? I just love it when the student becomes the master. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you're you're figuring out this is a racket, and yeah. that is this is typically, roughly speaking, the life of an asset manager. Right. He or she outperforms the market. They raise a few hundred million dollars. And with that money, they're all over everything and they can be really nimble. They can go into smaller companies. You know, the whole world is their universe. Yeah. And they can be all over stuff and apply a small group of really talented people to finding great opportunities. And they only need a few. And then because they post great returns, they go out and they're able to raise a lot more capital, which means mm -hmm. they have to put more capital to work, which limits the investments they can make. 
It means that um, they have to hire more people that maybe aren't as talented as the original investors. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, their returns become secondary to that 2% management fee. Yeah. If you're a billion-dollar credit fund and you post great returns and you're able to go out and raise 5, 10, then 20, on January 1, you make $400 million. And so your incentive becomes just to not do worse than the market. Yep. And you become a company that's not too big to fail, but but has the credibility such that the investor won't get fired. Yep. And that is asset allocators or people who work for these pension funds are not only in the business of making money, they're in the business of not getting fired. And when you have, when you invest in a, you know, a Bridgewater or whatever it is, a big, you know, uh, an Andreessen Horowitz or Sequoia, you kind of, you have defense. Even if the returns are off, it's like, well, wait, it's, it's Andreessen Horowitz, wait, it's Kleiner Perkins, wait, it's Sequoia yeah. Capital. And over time, usually, oftentimes these funds, their their returns diminish. And so they become asset collectors more than investors. Yeah. And that's why a lot of a lot of funds used to have a certain amount of capital allocated to new managers. And then on general, though, in general, private equity has been mostly about let's raise money and let's invest long and let's put up gates. So we get captive capital for five, seven, ten years. Yep. And in a bull market where everything is kind of going up and you can borrow money at insanely low interest rates, private equity is just about not being stupid, making a series of investments. And then the structure is you're just going to make a shit ton of money because we have a bull market going up 8% a year. And we can borrow money at 2.5% to get leverage. What do you know? We look like geniuses. So private equity has been an unbelievable business, but distinct to private equity if you were to just aggregate all returns for alternative investments, they have pretty much exactly underperformed the S&P yep. by the amount of their fees. And that is, in a weird way, I've been thinking a lot about unions. I would bet if you looked at what union membership has done, and I imagine there's an academic somewhere, has done for wages, that you would find the wages are about similar to non-union uh, workers except minus the cost of the actual union. And that is, I think the market, there's, there's, there's valleys and there's peaks, but the market wins and pierces the union yeah. and they're subject to the same supply and demand as everybody else. What has happened in alternative investments is it's a luxury item. And wealthy people and institutions like to think that they're smarter and they should get better returns by hiring smart people and paying for it. And what you find especially over the last 10 years, the way you would categorize or largely brand the hedge fund industry is expensive, but bad. And that is yeah. the returns have not only been the same as the S&P, they've been worse because no one will pay a hedge fund two and 20 to buy Apple or NVIDIA. It's like, boss, I can do that on my own. And yep. those stocks, those large cap, big name stocks have underperformed the stranger Byzantine stuff that these folks are supposed to find. So in sum, yeah. if you were to say, you know, the whole market is a giant head fake, the whole market is just basically a bunch of jazz hands and a bunch of people waving their arms, trust your instincts. This is an industry that is largely built on marketing, fear of missing out, and wanting to feel like you're smarter than the other institution or the other investors, so I invest with the hot manager. But it's mostly... What's the term? It's mostly bullshit. <laughs> so a couple of things. It just reminds me of this bet that Warren Buffett made back in 2008, where he made this bet with his hedge fund protege partners and said, I bet you that if I invest in the S&P 500, you can invest in whatever assets you want. I bet you that my returns over 10 years will beat yours. Um, he was losing the first two or three years and then eventually in year eight, Protégé just gave up because the S&P was outperforming, which gets me to the point that you made, which is PE firms are long term probably going to give you roughly the same returns as the S&P, except you also have to pay a management fee. So two questions. One, why, why do people invest in private equity? Um, I mean, is there something we're missing here? Maybe there's some massive upside in, in certain scenarios? And two, do you think that we should just be getting rid of those management fees? Do you think it's maybe fair that VC and PE shouldn't be charging that? 
Well, it has nothing to do with fair. It's what people, there's yeah. two sides of the transaction and people can decide what they want to do. But I'll, I'll, I'll ground this in, in my personal story, which I'm very good at. And that yep. is, when I was much younger, I had the opportunity to invest along Kleiner Perkins in a yep. wedding registry, a web-based wedding registry called Della and James, I think it was called. And I called my partner and I said, oh my God, and I think I was 29 at the time. I'd made a little bit of money in a company I started called Profit, maybe 30. I'm like, I mean, good news of good news. Kleiner Perkins, the premier VC fund, will let us co-invest with them in this wedding registry called Dell and Jane. So we scraped together everything we had, a quarter of a million bucks. 18 months later, it was a zero. What? And yeah, well, this is the internet. You know, it, the, the thing made no sense. The technology never worked. It, it just went straight to zero. And uh, at the same time, and let, let's fast forward. I've learned my lesson. I will not pay fees. And yeah. this is a story of privilege because <laughs> I get to co-invest with, with really smart private equity and VCs, and they are smart. But unless I can co-invest without fees, I don't do it. I just say yeah. right off the bat. And most people don't have access. I'm considered, quote unquote, a value add partner in some of this shit, which again, talk about jazz hands and a, and a head fake. <laughs> but occasionally a VC or a private equity fund will call and say, we're making a media or a tech investment. We'd yeah. like you involved. And I usually not only say I'm not gonna pay fees, but sometimes I ask for additional options. So I pay, I pay negative fees, if you will. Yeah. You should never pay fees, Ed. You should never pay fees. This is what mm -hmm. you should do. You should invest your money in a series of diversified ETFs and index funds from Vanguard, and you should as low as fee as possible because as exciting and as much as you want to believe that you're smart and can identify better managers who've gotten a lot of press and are on CNBC a lot, and they'll make you feel like you're getting to invest in something differentiated with people who are smarter than you, no one has any fucking idea what's going to happen in the markets. If you buy one stock... There's a 49% chance it'll go up the next day. And there's, you know, in five years, 10 years, there's about a 40% chance it'll be down, 60% chance it'll be up. You pick any five stocks in the S&P, and if you hold on to them for 10 years, nobody in the history of the markets has ever lost money, mm -hmm. ever. So what's the key? Low fees, diversification, and then recognizing, recognizing all of this is a lot of marketing and a lot of jazz hands. So here's the bad news, or here's the good news. I know how to get you rich. The bad news is the answer is slowly. And there will be a series of well-publicized hedge fund managers that outperform the market, and some of them are exceptional, but eventually the inflows of capital will starch out those returns, uh -huh. or, or luck, which tends to be symmetrical, they'll get their dose of bad luck. But the entire industry, the entire industry is a giant exercise in marketing. Uh -huh. Be very careful going into funds where you feel like you're getting some sort of special access and pour all over the fees. Two and 20, I think Vanguard charges like 10 bips. Yeah. So that means that means the other guys, the ones charging you two and 20, have to outperform by what is that, two and a half or 3% a year? Yeah. I mean, that's just, an, that, that's just really difficult. You're betting on a, you're betting on a horse that has a jockey that went to Prince, I'll give him that, <laughs> but who's 30 pounds heavier yeah. than the low fee jockey on the, on the other horse. I like that yeah. metaphor. I'm going to stick yeah, with that. <laughs> so my message to young people is try and resist the temptation to think you're smart or that you have access to some sort of special investor. They, don't, they, know may, they may not know less than you, but they don't know a lot more. The key is diversification and low fees. Thanks, Scott. Let's move on to our next story. Montana made headlines when it passed a statewide ban on TikTok, threatening the company and app store operators $10,000 fines for every user. TikTok users are exempt, but if the ban takes effect on January 1st as scheduled, they presumably won't be able to use the app inside the state's borders. Last week on Markets, Scott predicted the ban would be struck down by the courts. TikTok users and the company itself have already filed two separate lawsuits, for more on the legal challenges to Montana's TikTok ban and how they would apply to an anticipated federal ban of the app, here's Prof G Media's editor-in-chief and a former attorney, Jason Stavers, with this week's Unpack. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, I think right off the top, uh, every legal analyst that's taken a real look at Montana's ban will tell you this is not going to survive court review. 
Uh, and it's informative to understand why. And I think it also sheds some light on some of the challenges that proposed federal bans on TikTok might take. So you can think of court review of laws as like a maze, right? Legislatures pass a law, and then it has each law has to navigate a maze of limits that the Constitution puts on government power, right? So that's one of the fundamental things the Constitution does is it says, here are the things government can do, and here's a bunch of things the government can't do. Mm -hmm. uh, and in large part, that's a series of rights that we've identified in the people that the government can't unduly burden. And when courts look at laws passed by states, uh, there are even more limits on what state laws can do because the Constitution has taken certain domains and made them exclusively federal. And one of the challenges for Montana is that they, with this ban, they have stepped into at least two pretty significant areas that the Constitution reserves for the federal government. Mm. Uh, the first is interstate commerce. So states can manage the commerce that takes place within their own state. You can, for example, say how old someone has to be to buy alcohol. But what they can't do is burden commerce between the states. Mm. So California can't, for example, ban Oregon wine in California. They, they can ban wine, but not Oregon wine specifically. And they can't interfere too much with commerce between other states as well. So courts get very suspicious of that. Now, TikTok is clearly a nationwide platform, and there's a lot of commerce on TikTok, advertising, people selling things, et cetera. And so by trying to carve Montana out of that system, that Montana is limiting the ability of people outside Montana to reach in, people in Montana to reach out, and also interfering with people who are not Montana residents, but happen to be passing through Montana or do business with people in Montana that somehow connected with their use of TikTok. So that's something the federal government can do and does quite aggressively but not something courts want to see Montana do. Mm -hmm. The next area is even more of a problem, right? The stated reason for this ban, or one of them anyway, is the concern that the Chinese government will somehow use TikTok to harm citizens of Montana. Well, that is very clearly within the realm of foreign policy. And foreign policy is very much something that the Constitution reserves to the federal government. For good reason, right? The U.S. should speak with one voice uh, when it communicates outside. If we had 50 different governments all managing their own little mini foreign policies, it would be something of a mess. So courts are going to be very suspicious of a state law which purports to, to act in the foreign policy arena. Now, those are specific to state laws, right? A federal TikTok ban will not face either of those problems because these are things the federal government is allowed to do. The third problem with the Montana ban could have been avoided, uh, and that is that this ban is likely to be considered what's called a bill of attainder. Uh, bill of attainders have a colorful history. Uh, 600 years ago, Henry VIII was a big fan of bills of attainder. A bill of attainder is essentially a law that is passed to punish an individual. So normally, when we want to punish an individual, we take them to court right? And they get the due process of a court, potentially a jury and everything else. Well, Henry VIII didn't want to take some of his political enemies to court. So he simply had parliament, which he controlled, pass a law saying someone had con committed various crimes. He used bills of attainder to execute, among other people, Thomas Cromwell and his fifth wife, Catherine. So when the framers drafted the Constitution, they said, we do not want uh, George Washington deciding he can have uh, his mm -hmm. political opponents executed, so no bills of attainder. Now, this is actually a very easy problem to get around, and the federal bans that are being considered do this. All Montana had to do was say a certain class of companies, social media companies that are owned by adversarial governments, for example, are subject to this ban. Or they could have said companies subject to this ban will be determined by the executive, by the governor, on, based on some principles. And that is a typical way that Congress and state legislatures get around this issue. And it's also just more principled because it makes everything somewhat more clear. Instead, though, Montana, I mean, the ban itself, the statute is called a ban on TikTok. So that's a third problem. But that one is that one applies to the federal government, but could be avoided. OK, then we get to two more challenges. And I should say all three of those are probably enough to have the Montana ban knocked out. And courts will likely rely on those straightforward problems. But there are two very significant issues with this ban, which also apply to a federal ban. Uh, the first, which has gotten a lot of ventilation in the press, is that TikTok is a popular platform for speech. Yeah. Uh, and so courts, are not, courts do not allow the Congress to burden free speech unnecessarily. 
Here, TikTok will say, and TikTok users will say, look, TikTok allows us to communicate with so many people around the country and around the world in unique ways. And the proof of that is simply the popularity of TikTok, right? Uh, the government can say, sure, but there's other ways you can communicate. But it's quite clear that TikTok offers people something they can't get anywhere else. That's mm -hmm. why so many people are flocking to TikTok. So courts will be very suspicious of a government attempt to limit that speech. And by banning the app entirely, they're completely eliminating that speech. There's another significant constitutional infirmity with these bans, though, that hasn't gotten as much attention, but I think is a very serious one. And that is the fact that TikTok accounts are valuable property for people who use them to make an income. And this is something that we're seeing in Montana right now. The first lawsuit against this statute was not filed by TikTok, but was filed by a group of TikTok users. Right. And they're very sympathetic plaintiffs, right? They say, hey, so for example, you have a former Marine who makes TikToks about life as a veteran, and she makes a significant portion of her income through the, her TikTok account. And then they had the wife of a rancher who TikToks about rural life. She has tripled her family's household income on the basis of her TikTok account. Mm. So a TikTok ban takes that property away. Well, the Constitution was put in place in substantial part to protect property rights from government intrusion. The government can't take your property without due process, meaning they have to give you an opportunity to defend your property. And if they take it for, for no other good reason, they have to compensate you for it. So it seems very unlikely, and I haven't seen any effort by these TikTok bans that are being proposed to develop some sort of compensation program or some sort of uh, system for protecting the property rights of people who've built up some pretty substantial businesses on their TikTok accounts. So those two issues, I think, are pretty significant and could potentially be fatal to any TikTok ban. If the federal government passes a ban and they bring these arguments to court, what courts will do is they will weigh these issues, the the burden on speech and the burden on property rights against the potential threat. So here, a challenge for the government is that the threat is largely hypothetical, right? They don't have evidence or much evidence that the Chinese government is actually doing any of the things that we're concerned yeah. about. Yeah, so courts are going to say, look, I mean, this sounds bad, but until you have proof that they're doing it, we're not going to eliminate millions of people's speech and property rights. The other thing courts will do is they will say, is this the most narrowly tailored thing that you could do to prevent this harm? And here, I think the government has a real problem justifying a TikTok ban because there, the harms here are not really TikTok itself, but other things that the government of China or potentially TikTok are going to do. So I think courts and challengers to these laws can genuinely say, hey, why don't you do this? Why don't you enforce data privacy laws? Why don't you enforce disclosure laws? Or if the things that China is supposedly going to do are not yet illegal, make those things illegal. Make manipulating these accounts illegal, right? Make spying on Americans illegal and then go enforce those laws. Yep. That's a much more narrowly focused approach that doesn't present nearly the same problems for speech and for property rights. So I, I think having looked at this, uh, it's going to be tough for a federal ban on TikTok to survive court challenge. And I will say that what Montana did here was grandstanding. It, this law is, is poorly drafted and is not going to last. But yep. it has served a useful function, which is that these conversations are often hard to pin down in the abstract. But yep. when you get a law and you get a court case and, and lawyers begin to write briefs and, and pull plaintiffs into the situation, a lot of these issues get clearer and it becomes more apparent what is going to pass constitutional review and what's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people talk about it more, including this podcast. Um, yeah. Scott, Scott, you've come out in favor of a nationwide ban of TikTok. You cited the risks of Chinese government interference. Do you think it's worth it for Congress to take on what, as Jason has pointed out, looks like a very tough legal fight? Or should it try some other approach? Uh, Jason's points are really interesting. I think that as the, so courts are charged with interpreting the law as it stands. And my understanding is that as the law currently stands, they pretty much don't have a leg to stand on. Is that correct, Jason? Uh, as the law currently stands, the Montana law? Yeah, the, yeah, the Montana the, law is profoundly The Montana insane. governor in his, this proposed ban is just not going to stand legal scrutiny based on where laws are right now. Yeah. 
it would. And would it's I... notable that the, the governor actually tried to get them to revise the law substantially. He sent <laughs> them a different draft and was like, guys, try this one. And that one is a lot less terrible. It probably it wouldn't have survived either. But it's quite clear that this the ban in Montana has so many problems. It's It's sort of embarrassing. But this represents bad governance on a number of levels. One, what is your job? You should always ask yourself, what is your job? We, we try and ask ourselves out here. We try and educate people. We try and educate and entertain. That, that's our job. What is a governor's job? A governor's job is an operational job. It's an, it's an executive job. He's supposed to be figuring out how to get ranchers water. He's supposed to make sure that prepare for the next series of wildfires in Montana. He's not there to, to kind of make sweeping changes to and ban a media company. That's mm -hmm. just not what a governor is supposed to do. If he wants to do that, he should run for Senate. In addition, the net effect of this will be helping TikTok because people are busy. And what they will see is that courts in the U.S. struck down a ban, mm -hmm. which will make it more difficult to actually ban TikTok, which should be done through a new law passed by Congress. And that law has been proposed, the Restrict Act, which would give the Commerce Department the rights to ban a media outlet that is hosted in a country that is deemed adversarial. I think the list is Venezuela, North Korea, Iran, Russia, and China. Mm. That would be a law that would be a systemic solution that they, the federal government could then apply if it saw TikTok as a threat. That is, that is how laws are made and how they're enforced. When a governor starts try, trying to pass laws that are going to be overturned because they don't hold up in court, that is a waste of everybody's time and in the end makes it less likely that the federal government is going to get to put in place a law that creates a, syst a systemic solution to do this correctly. Jason, what did I get right and wrong there? Well, I think that uh, I would largely agree with you with respect to the state situation. And and as, as I said, the Constitution is very specific about some things that states just aren't supposed to do. And and the Montana government is trying to do those things here. Uh, and I think that the, the systematic approach, putting in a law in place that the executive can implement when necessary, that's exactly right. Like, that's kind of how the system is supposed to work. I do think that in this particular case, it's going to be very difficult for a blanket ban on TikTok, no matter who promulgates it or how it's written, to survive constitutional scrutiny because it is such a substantial burden on the speech rights of TikTok's users and a substantial burden on their rights to the property they have in these TikTok accounts. Now, that's not saying it's impossible. Both of those arguments will be challenged by the government in defense of these laws. And there are legal arguments you can make to try to get around those problems, but they're pretty significant. And given that there are likely more narrowly tailored ways to address the potential threat here, I think it's unlikely courts will permit uh, a widespread total ban. This was great. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. Let's take a look at the week ahead. We've got earnings from Salesforce, Broadcom, Lululemon, Nordstrom, and Macy's. We'll see the unemployment rate for April, and we'll also see if Congress can come to an agreement on the debt ceiling. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen previously warned the US government could run out of money to pay its bills by June 1st. That's this Thursday. Scott, any predictions? I have a short-term and a long-term prediction, or medium-term. So regarding the debt ceiling, uh, 11th hour resolution. Um, okay. I just um, I think the incentives are just too great for both parties or all parties to um, avoid this. So I, I think and also I, I don't want to accuse Secretary Yellen of catastrophizing, but they they have a tendency, at least in the past, to say things are going to get really bad sooner than they probably would uh, to try and motivate people to get something to uh, to get something done. And. Uh, so the markets appear to think a deal is going to get done. I believe a deal is going to get done. That's my short-term prediction. My long-term prediction is that Linda Yaccarino will be fired from Twitter or will resign. Uh, listening to that shit show that was the Governor DeSantis announcement for his run for president, where they basically made the escalators, you know, announcement of Trump look sophisticated and elegant. You know, this thing was just such a shit show. It was like 2014 called and wants his podcast back. 
<laughs> and by the way, I now understand why the wipers on my Falcon X Tesla didn't work. I mean, if he can't understand how to host a podcast, we're going to reach, supposedly there were 200,000 people in the room listening to Governor DeSantis uh, announce his candidacy for president. This podcast will reach 200,000 people or will reach, I think we'll reach 150 or 170,000. And they couldn't figure it out. They couldn't, they couldn't actually host it. So this was such a fail and gives you such insight into what chaos the company is. And Ms. Acarino, who is a talented woman and people really like her, she has a great relationship with advertisers, is coming into an environment where she's not the CEO, she's the yeah. COO. It's yeah. ridiculous that they find, give her the CEO title, but let's be honest, she's the COO. He's already stated that he's in charge of product and strategy. Well, what exactly does the CEO do? Anyway, uh, you've had a 60% decline in advertising dollars. She's been tasked with rejuvenating and re-jump or jump-starting, recapturing a lot of that advertising revenue. And I'll say this at can where I'm going um, in about a month. What would, on a risk-adjusted basis, be stupider than advertising on Twitter? A, it's subscale and their technology sucks. It's never shown a great ROI to advertisers. It's always been a subscale business with a shittier ad stack and targeting than Meta or Google. And now, and now you have a CEO, and he's the CEO who might, as he has done before, threaten legal action against advertisers who stop advertising. Remember when he did that? Mm -hmm. Or maybe say to you or your CEO that you hate humanity. He's done that. Or put your content next to really vile, anti-Semitic, bigoted content under the auspices of free speech. So if you're a CMO looking to be fired unceremoniously, you should advertise on Twitter. And this is what's going to happen. Advertising is not going to recover. She's been given an impossible task. She will be blamed for all of his dumbass first ballot Hall of Fame stupid decisions, and she will either resign or be fired. Linda Yaccarino's tenure at Twitter will be less than 12 months. They have poured a billion gallons of honey on her and sent her hunting for bears. Thank you for listening to Property Markets. Join us Wednesday for Office Hours, and we'll be back with a fresh take on markets every Wednesday, the university formerly known as Prince. Have fun, Ed. Have fun. <laughs> I will.